Um, and now I would like to pass the microphone to Dr. Jesse Arlen to. Well, good evening, everyone. Yes, and we're so glad to be here uh, this evening for the fifth uh, presentation in this series, Entering the World, Mind, and Soul of St. Narsesh Ali. And Father Mesro Barsamian comes to us tonight, not just as our primate, uh, as our beloved primate, but also as a student and scholar of St. Narsesh Ali. And I'd like to just say a few words about his uh, educational background as it pertains to uh, what he'll be speaking on tonight. So a native of Yerevan, Father Mesrop attended Gevorkian Theological Seminary of Holy Etchmiadzin, where he received his bachelor's degree in theology in 2003, with a thesis related to Yerishe's history of Vartan and the Armenian War. He was ordained into the Holy Priesthood that same year. He then earned a master's degree in theology and religious sciences from the University of Strasbourg in France in 2007, with a master's thesis related to the theology of Hans Urs von Balthasar, which he wrote in French. From 2007 to 2011, he taught moral theology at Gevorkian Theological Seminary. And in 2011, he was awarded the rank of Vartabed, Doctor of Theology, defending a thesis on St. Narsesh Norali, entitled Linel Astvads, Martu Astvadzatsman Yerasti Jan Janabarn, Ust Surt Narsesh Noralu Vartabadutian. Or in English translation, we could say Becoming God, the threefold path of the deification of man, according to the teaching of St. Narsesh Norali. And this thesis was later published as a book in 2015 with the same title. And one of the really remarkable and important things about this book is that it actually focuses on the spirituality of St. Narsesh Ali. So many scholars just look at um, the writings of our church fathers as literature or as history or what they can tell us about uh, social conditions, political conditions of the time. Um, but Father Mastrop has taken the approach of um, looking at the spirituality of our church fathers, such as St. Narsesh Norali, not just in the context of the Armenian tradition, but also comparatively uh, across traditions, looking also at um, related concepts in the writings of the Greek fathers and Latin fathers as well. And an English language article related to this book uh, is going to be published in 2024 in an upcoming issue of the St. Narcissus Theological Review. And of course, alongside his, his study and his work as a Vartabed and a scholar, he's had a fruitful pastoral ministry on multiple continents, both serving at the parish level and in ecclesi ecclesiastical administration in the diocese of the US and France. From 2019 to 21, he served as the Dean of Gevorkian Theological Seminary, and of course, on May 17, 2022, was elected as the 13th Primate of the Eastern Diocese, and we all look forward to his consecration as Bishop next month. And lastly, I just want to mention that uh, together he and I are working currently on a new translation, along with a theological and spiritual commentary on St. Narsesh Norali's famous prayer of 24 stanzas, Havadov Chostovanim, With Faith I Confess, which will be completed in the coming months. And tonight he will be speaking to us on the topic, St. Narses the Gracious and the Threefold Way of Theosis. Thank you, Thank you Jesse. Um, so as you may know, um, uh, um, Today we woke up to the news that uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh, our brothers and sisters are on, under attack. Uh, Hayr Mesro uh, is going to graciously of, offer a prayer, uh, remembering our brothers and sisters in Artsakh. Uh, please keep them in your prayers. Um, Hayr uh, yeah, Thank you. Thank you, Dera. Thank you, Jesse. As you know, uh, we are, our hearts are heavy because of what's happening right now in Artsakh. 
uh, Azeris, they continue shelling Stepanagert and uh, Artsakh. And uh, this morning, I sent out a directive asking our people to pray. And uh, we continuously, we pray for our people and uh, we'll do whatever we can do to help our brothers and sisters in Artsakh and in Armenia. And uh, this evening, I invite you to pray with me uh, for our beloved Artsakh, our brothers and sisters who are going through uh, hardship through difficulties and uh, genocide. May God protect them, uh, their families, and uh, our country, our homeland. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. O merciful Lord, we come before you in a humble but resolute spirit, seeking your grace and mercy in this time of great need. We ask you to incline your ear to our prayers this evening. Our hearts are heavy with concern for the people of Artsakh who are enduring immense suffering and hardship. We beseech you, Lord, to strengthen them in their struggles, to provide them with courage and resilience amidst their trials. Grant them comfort in their pain and solace in their grief. We plead for your divine protection over the people of Artsakh. Shield them from harm, defend them from violence and oppression, and surround them with your loving embrace. Pour out your grace upon our ancestral land of Artsakh, that they may find security and peace. We offer these petitions with trusting hearts, knowing that you are a compassionate and loving God. May your will be done, and may your peace reign in Artsakh and throughout the world. And to you we offer glory and honor, now and forever. Amen. Friends, tonight I'm going to talk as Jesse mentioned about St. Nurses Schnorali's teaching of theosis and uh, the threefold way to attain the theosis. Uh, and I have been working on this topic uh, when I wrote my Vartabedagan, and it continues to be the center of my research, the spirituality of our church fathers, especially St. Nurses Schnorali. And it gives me just this evening, I was thinking before the lecture, I said, our church fathers, Shnorali, Krikor, Naregatsi, Mesrob Mashtos, and others, they created their spirituality, their theology, in the circumstances like this, when our country was going through suffering and hardship and persecution, genocide, because they saw the presence of God in that trouble. And they saw the importance to share that with our people, to give them that comfort that God is always with us, whatever we are going through in our personal lives, but also uh, in the life of our people, of our country, and in the world. Because it's crucial to understand the purpose and the meaning of our lives. Because the question of our life's destiny is crucial. And it addresses the most important issue for us. Why are we here on earth? If we adopt the right perspective on this fundamental question and discover our true purpose, then it will guide us in making the right choices in specific situations we encounter daily. So why are we are here on earth? to understand the meaning, the purpose of our lives. Then it will guide us in making the right choices in specific situations we encounter daily. This includes our interaction with others, our education, career, marriage, and even in raising children. On the other hand, if you fail to properly engage with this core issue, we risk failing in fulfilling the specific purposes in our lives. After all, how can any particular aim have significance if we haven't established the overarching meaning of our existence? The purpose of our lives is revealed. Sorry. In the first chapter of the Holy Bible, in the book of Genesis, where it says that God created man in his image and likeness. 
So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So this shows the immense love that triune God has for humanity. God's intent is not merely for us to be creatures with specific talents, attributes, or even a unique place in creation. Rather, his desire is for us to become gods like him through his grace. On the surface, humans appear to exist in a purely biological manner, like similar to the other animals. While it's true that we are animals, as San Nersashnurali Apli puts it, we are animals in communion with God. We stand apart from the rest of creation because we are the only beings with souls made in the image of God, granting us the potential to become gods. The phrase in his image refers to the unique gifts that God has bestowed only upon humans, setting us apart as reflections of himself. These gifts include reason, conscious, and individual sovereignty, which encompasses freedom, creativity, love, and longing for the absolute and for God. They also include personal self-awareness and other qualities that elevate humans above all other living beings, making us truly human and distinct individuals. In other words, these are the gifts that shape us into persons and are the essence of what it means to be created in his image. Being created in his image, we are called to be completed in his likeness. Being created in his image, we are called to be completed in his likeness. This is theosis, deification, in Armenian astva zatsum. God, who is divine by nature, invites us to become divine through his grace. The gifts that shape us in his image are bestowed upon us by God for a greater purpose. They are meant to enable us to attain a likeness to our God and creator. The aim is not just for us to have an external moral relationship with God, but to achieve a personal union with our creator. It may seem audacious to say or even think that the purpose of our lives is to become God's through grace. However, neither the Holy Bible nor the church fathers have hidden this from us. I put here some of verses from the Bible and the church fathers so that you see like in the Psalms 82 verse 6, the psalmist says, I say you are God's children of the Most High, all of you. The second Peter, thus he has given us through these things his precious and very great promise so that through them we may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of lust and may become participants of the divine nature. So the participants of divine nature, we are called to become the participants of divine nature. And finally, as St. Athanasius says, God became man in order that man might become God. St. Leon, St. Irenaeus of Leon, St. Athanasius and other church fathers, they repeat constantly, God became man in order that man might become God. So Shnurali directly addresses the topic in his poems and hymns that are intended for a broader audience. So he talks about theosis, deification, asvazatsum, just in his beautiful and simple poems and hymns. And my presentation tonight will delve into Shnurali's perspective on this critical concept of theosis, as well as the threefold path to attaining it. It will highlight San Nurse's vision on theosis with the following themes the mystery of incarnation and theosis, and three steps toward theosis, purification, illumination, and perfection. Now the first, the mystery of incarnation and theosis. God became man in order that man might become God. This profound saying, as I said, was repeatedly recited in the church's long history. And it, it expresses the fact that God humbled himself to the deepest realities of our corrupted human nature to the point of death, thus opening the union of humanity with God. By the incarnation of the Son of God, the way of descent makes possible for humans the way of ascent, like we read in this short but beautiful passage from Jesus Vorti, 
where Schnorr Ali writes, for this reason, he comes down from the unreachable glory above so that we might rise a bit to him from this world here below. The theosis, according to St. Nerses, could be possibly only through the incarnation of the Son of God. The union of divine and human natures in Christ is exclusively that of salvation. The result of the union of two natures in Christ was the divinization of human nature assumed by the Lord. The incorporeal word, ban astuzo, joined with the flesh and united to himself our human nature and deified it by joining and uniting with it. Therefore, the image icon has been restored in Christ and has been raised to the image of images. Another important expression of this spiritual depth and the depth that is St. Nerses' reflection on the Sermon on the Mount, which is the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ's teaching. In his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew and the spiritual poem, Jesus Vorti, St. Nerses explain, explains the meaning of the Beatitudes, Yeraniner, as a symbol of spiritual ladder a guide to heaven for the life of Christians. The Beatitudes are, according to St. Nerses, the way to heaven and awareness of a once seen and spiritual poverty leads to joyous tears and repentance, a sign of the Lord's consolation. It is through this catharsis the one receives inner reconciliation and peace and seeks to keep the Lord's commandments. The meaning of the commandments is fully discovered with the cleansing of the soul. So Christian perfection and healing are conditioned by the fact of the incarnation of the Son of God. And in one of his poems, St. Nerses emphasizes that through the healing and salvation of the incarnation, humans became friends of God and experienced union with the divine. The comparison of Beatitudes with nine angelic orders is described by St. Nerses within the framework of Dionysian terminology, purification, illumination, and perfection. In his encomium on the Archangels, St. Nerses follows the mystical theology of St. Dionysius of Areopagite by mentioning three angelic hierarchies, which include the nine angelic orders. This is, which is the teaching of our church. And these hierarchies have three important functions, to purify, to illuminate, and to perfect. He writes, O oh Lord, you establish three hierarchies for purifying, illuminating, and perfecting. And this threefold division can describe the spiritual journey summarized in the Beatitudes for St. Nurses emphasizes the necessity of a strict order between the celestial hierarchies. Thus, the Beatitudes could be interpreted as a tripartite ladder for those seeking purification, illumination, and perfection. So here again, you can see the first three Beatitudes are about grace, born out of the efforts of repentance, love towards poverty, humility, humility, and the tears of reconciliation. The second group of three Beatitudes deals with the virtues of Christian life, thirst for righteousness, mercy, and purity of heart. These three Beatitudes prepare the soul to meet God. And finally, the third group includes peace as a contemplation of God's mystery. And the last two most perfect Beatitudes, readiness and eagerness to be persecuted because of the Lord and for righteousness sake. Acting as a uniting bridge between all the Beatitudes, these two are also the signs of the last temptations and of sainthood. That's why we call all the martyrs, we recognize them as saints, because they are willing to give their lives, like our people today in Artsakh. Uh, they are willing to give their lives for Christ and for the gospel. So faithful to the patristic tradition, on the commentary on the parable of the prodigal son, St. Nerses Shnorali distinguishes the three main categories of faithful. First are servants who follow the will of the master of God because of the fear of going to hell. 
higher tense second, those who keep the divine commandments with hope of gaining the way to heaven. And finally, the sons who do everything for the sake of the love of God. The commentary of St. Nerses is based on the patristic tradition in which the above mentioned categories of faithful represent the threefold way of theosis, of deification, asvatsatsum. From a simple feeling such as fear, we must make every effort in order to attain the supreme state of the feeling of a child to our parents, to our Heavenly Father. And uh, here we can see like how we start being a servant and then higher hands and the sons when we arrive at that level that we do everything. We keep the commandments uh, just because of love, just because we recognize our heavenly father and we keep his word. And the same threefold ways is mentioned also in the encyclical letter of St. Nerses in his exhortation to the clergy. He writes to the clergy, he says, first, let each one be cleansed by confession from unclean thoughts. So this is the purification, unclean thoughts and deeds, and virtuously offer himself as a living sacrifice to the living God. So this is the second illumination when you are practicing the virtues. And it is then that he will be able to serve the Holy of Holies and the inner man escape the inextinguishable fire of torment. So, uh, and here we can see just Briefly, how he speaks about the threefold way of spiritual life of theosis, uh, and he compares that with the structure of our churches. Uh, I wrote this uh, in my uh, in my book. Uh, I don't I don't want to uh, talk like in details about this uh, comparison, but. Uh, in the church, uh, in, in patristic tradition, and the St. Nurses too, he, he compares these threefold ways uh, with the three-parted structure of our churches, like narthex, where the purification takes place, then the temple, where faithful, where faithful are illuminated, they receive the light of God, the grace of God, when they practice the virtues, and finally, on the altar, and he, as he talks here, uh, Holy of Holies, we are united with the Holy Communion. We are united uh, with God. So uh, the duty and vocation of a Christian is to follow the, this threefold way of spiritual life, threefold way of theosis, from the earthly to the heavenly realms, from human to divine. So it is a journey. We are crossing each stage and we are uh, on our journey toward heaven. And the aim of our life is to receive in our, our hearts and within our souls to be united with the same and to be God by grace, becoming one with God as St. Nurses Shnorali writes. So now how we do that, how uh, we walk that journey, uh, and that is the second part of my presentation when I am going to... Uh, present these three steps toward theosis, purification, makrutsyun, illumination, lusavorutsyun, and perfection, gadarelutsyun. So the first stage of spiritual life is a special purification time. You see, this is the narthex of uh, Gerhard. When I, I was talking about, we have the narthex, Kavit, where this purification takes place. That's why usually the narthexes are so you know dark and uh, it's uh, gives the sensation of repentance to to repent and to start to think about our sins and to confess them and to be purified. So the first stage is the purification. Following the tradition of the church and nurses considers the human heart and mind as the center of spiritual life. So the mind and the heart. And in order to attain perfection, one must cleanse the center of the spiritual world from sins. The cleansing of the heart constitutes the first stage of spiritual preparation through the healing of the three energies of the heart, mind, desire, and will. So those are the three energies of the heart, mind, desire, and will. And in their genuine natural state, they must be oriented toward the Lord. The mind should look for God. 
the desire should yearn for him and the will's actions should put in the perfect harmon harmony all the carnal desires and aspirations of the body. The lack of these actions creates a chaotic movement in our inner world. Instead of looking for God, the mind is suffering from the absence of the Lord. The desire, contrary to its genuine function, remains unclosed in the narrow circle of selfishness, and the will is subjected to the passions of the body. St. Nerses often identifies the mind with the conscience, the chichmadats. In Armenian, is a beautiful word, chichmadan, chichmadats, a conscience of mind. And it makes clear the analogy he writes in Jesus Vorti, Jesus, uh, thus in the city of mine, which you constructed with your own hands, you have put my conscience of mind as a judge of my widowed soul. What a beautiful image, isn't it? The mind judges the actions of the soul and body. The throne of the mind or conscience is in the heart. An analogy that sometimes refers to the unjust judge from the parable of the persistent widow. He says, as a judge of my widowed soul. Uh, and this is the parable of the persistent widow from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. And for St. Nerses, this parable perfectly reveals the allegorical content. The figure of the unjust judge represents the human mind which must do justice in the quarrel between soul and body. Following this interpretation, the mind has absolute freedom without any fear from God or humans. It is independent and self-reliant and its passions and thoughts are invisible. Nevertheless, when the mind is enslaved by and subjected to the passions, it loses the capacity to judge and to keep the natural balance between soul and body. One must heal the mind and cleanse it from evil thoughts in order to live in perpetual longing for God's presence. The purification is a deliverance from different and evil thoughts as well. When evil thoughts of the mind should be confined to the heart and eradicated. When a thought enters our heart and mind, it becomes passion and tends to be realized in our lives. It means that the thought is being transformed from rational power to the passion. Despite its depth, the theological vision of St. Nurses could not be understood without referring to its practical side. The reconciliation and confession of sins play a key role for the cleansing of the heart and mind. It's possible only through the reconciliation and confession of sins. They are necessary for the entrance to God's kingdom. As he writes in his general ep epistle, Tuchtan Tanragan, and having taken this with compassion and repentance, you will drink without distaste, you will cleanse your souls of the bitterness of the bile of corruption, and you will become worthy of the mercy of God and the good things that were promised by him. According to St. Nurses, repentance, Abash Haruchum, is the abandoning of our old self and taking up the new one, rejuvenated by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Proven by the living spiritual experience, this state of purification means to be detached from all things material. What remains is everything that can revive our passions and their reasons, to cleanse the heart and the mind from the sins with joyous tears. Artsunk neru makrutsun. With repentance and reconciliation, one may reject the darkness and the infidelity to the word of God and to return to the veritable source of life. The rejection of evil is not sufficient. It should always be accompanied by orthodox faith and works of kindness to attain the illumination. And this is the second uh, step of uh, the threefold way the illumination when after cleansing our minds and hearts uh, from the scene, from the darkness, we enter into the temple where you see the light. And this picture I choose from the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, the Jerakaluit service. You see beautifully how people, each of them represented light 
that they enter into the temple and they are celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. We are celebrating uh, the resurrection of our Lord being in his presence. St. Nurses is convinced that illumination takes place within two different yet interconnected contexts of practical and theoretical experiences. They are two luminous eyes with which we are granted the vision of the divine. He writes, O wisdom of the Father, grant me your wisdom to be skillful in practice and in theory. De Sagani of Kortsnagan, he says, in order to gaze at the heaven with the grace of your light. It is important to know that one must keep two eyes open, that is, practical and theoretical sides of spiritual life. Otherwise, the spiritual life is not perfect and balanced. According to St. Nurses, theory and practice, De Sagan, Yevkortsnagan, are synonymous with the Orthodox faith and works of kindness. As uh, we see also St. Gregory of Narek uh, wrote um, uh, a treaty, a treatise based uh, uh, entitled Vasan Ugapar Habado Yev Arakinaser Varuts, the Orthodox faith and the practical, the works of uh, kindness. And now just uh, quick words about the prayer, uh, which is the supreme cardinal virtue leading to the way of theosis. As I said, in this stage, illumination, we are practicing the virtues and the greatest virtue is, is the prayer. And it is a contemplative mystical experience when the mind is uplifted to God. Prayer as it is formulated by St. Nurses is an encounter with the living God, a beatitude granted by God. Hence, it is a divine grace. And uh, that's why he prays. And therefore, we beg you, O Lord, grant us to be constantly before you in the prayer with a pure mind. Prayer is like a spiritual breathing, like constantly to pray. It begins with tears um, in the building of the heart where it dwells the mind. And this is the beatific vision, Yeraneli de Suchum is accompanied with the inner illumination and peace, which are desirable stations uh, leading to theosis, to perfection. It is no coincidence that St. Nurses identifies the virtue with light, illumination, and several parts of his spiritual canticles and prayers could even be described as songs of light, lucer kutium. And I'm going to talk about that this weekend uh, in Cambridge, at our sacred music uh, uh, festival when we are going to talk about the Arevakal hymns and the, the theology of light in uh, San Nesta Schnorali's uh, spirituality, which is which is beautiful. He is one of the greatest church fathers, not only in the Armenian church, but uh, in the Christian church, uh, developing and uh, talking about the spirituality of uh, spirituality of light, because I strongly believe that he had that uh, beatific vision. He saw the light in his prayer, and he, he shared that uh, with uh, with his flock, with his uh, faithful. So the final, the third stage is the perfection, which is theosis in Greek and in Armenian asvazatsum. Uh, the illumination leads to personal relationship with God, the highest level of Christian life. The knowledge of divine is more complete at this stage and seeks to bring us into the state of transfiguration. And it happens on the altar, as you see, uh, in the, the altar of Holy Echmeazin, which Arajastvats, God willing, will be open next year, next summer, at the Feast of uh, Holy Echmeazin. And Theosis, Asvazatsum, is the summit of the knowledge of the divine as unapproachable. God becomes approachable to the extent of the capacities of the human mind. And he, uh, this uh, knowledge and this theosis happens thanks to the grace of God. It's not our, uh, you know, our merit or our uh, work, but it's God's grace. He grants us that knowledge and that theosis. According to the New Testament, the Christian perfection finds its real realization in love, which unites us with God. 
as the Apostle John writes, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. So faithful to the spirit of the New Testament, St. Nerses admits the important role of the love on the way of Astvazatsum. He clearly highlights the Trinitarian dimension of that love in the life of the church. This is one of uh, my uh, favorite uh, sharagans from San Nerse Shnorali. Uh, it's, it's just beautiful. He writes, love born from love sent love. Can you imagine? Love born from love sent love. Like that. And through you, united his members to himself. The church built by it, she confirmed on seven pillars and as rulers of the house instituted the apostles and adorned it with your seven gifts. Dispel from us also the darkness of sins and put on us the light of glory. The love is a divine grace that transcends the human nature and mind. Moreover, human love is a product of divine love, for the source, source of human love is intra-Trinitarian love. As you see in this uh, Sharagan, the divine love reveals itself to human creatures as an inner light and warmth. The lack of this warmth is death, and the absence of inner light alarms us about the disease of the human soul. The supreme stage of the divine love to which one can attain in this life is acquired during the mystical wedding, a perfect union with God. In the spiritual vision of St. Nerses, the love of Christ has a key role, for it is on the basis of the love that the whole spiritual life is directed to the process of astvazasun, theosis. This is symbolically described as a union of a bridegroom, Jesus Christ, with a bride, human soul, or the church. In the Old Testament, the bridegroom was the Lord himself. He was in union with his bride, the people of Israel, while in the New Testament, the bride is the human soul, the church. This image of mystical love and union became more explicit in the later centuries, acquiring general character in the writings of universal and Armenian church fathers' writings. The basic narratives upon which this image was developed are the following gospel verses. Then John's disciple came and asked him, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom, bridegroom mourn while he's with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. Then the second quote from the Gospel of Matthew. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. And the third one, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. The joy is mine, and it is now complete. Friends, the allegorical meaning of the wedding banquet is twofold in the writings of St. Nurses. It could be expressed both individually and collectively. The individual dimension could be found in the hearts of the faithful. The heart is a bridal room where the soul meets the bridegroom. This allegory is most probably based on the famous verse of the Gospel of Matthew, where too the heart is described as a sacred inner chamber of human nature. In Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 6, where our Lord says, when you pray, enter into your room and close the door. So that's the inner chamber, our heart, where we can meet uh, our bridegroom. And the collective meaning of the bride reveals the character of the church as an earthly and eschatological reality. It relates to death, judgment, and the final destiny of the soul and humankind. The church 
herself is an expression of collective conscience and experience, and it is preordained to join her bridegroom at the end of time. Thus, the road to Astvazatsum Theosis begins in this life, in the bosom of the church, but it finds its fulfillment at the end of time when we when we'll start the new era and new life in the kingdom of God. It is at the end of time that God will call on the church to be prepared for the perfect and divine union with the bridegroom. Knowing the incredible destiny that awaits us brings immense joy to our lives. To set our sights on deification, astvazatsum, sweetens the pain in every trial and all the worries of life. As I said today, as our people, they are going through this hardship and difficulty, which we can describe through the terms of beatitudes, when they are suffering for the justice, for righteousness sake, and for Christ's sake, it brings joy when you, we put, we consecrate our uh, focus on the theosis, on the purpose, the meaning of our lives, which is deification, astvazatsum. In this case, theosis completely changes our attitude towards our fellow human beings and changes it for the better. How much deeper and more substantial will be the guidance which we will then give to our children? In what a God-pleasing way a father and a mother will then love and respect their children, feeling the responsibility and holy charge which they have towards them? How much will they then help them by the grace of God to attain Astvazatsum, the purpose of for which they brought them into the world. How much more respect will we have for ourselves when we feel that we have been molded for this great purpose, when we are without the egotism and pride which opposes God? Friends, certainly St. Nerses and all the fathers of the church say that it is in this way, by overcoming our self-love egotism, that we become real people, true men and women. Then we will meet God with love, but also meet our fellow human beings with respect and true dignity, not seeing them as tools of pleasure and, and exploitation, but as icons of God destined for Asfadzatsu. Thank you for your attention. Um, I would like to ask Harsurp um, to uh, give us a closing prayer. So, um, can all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Guardian and hope of all your faithful Christ, our God, guard and protect us. Guard and protect our homeland, Armenia and Artsakh, and protect our brothers and sisters today as they are going through persecution, through hardship, through genocide and starvation. Bless and protect them, and bless and protect our diocese and our faithful here in the United States and grant us your wisdom, your light, so that we can walk our spiritual journey from purification to illumination and finally to be united with you in perfection in Asfadzatsum as you are calling us to walk that uh, walk, to walk that path. And bless and protect us all under the wings of your holy and venerable cross in peace. Deliver us from all enemies, visible and invisible. And may God's worthy to glorify you with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and always and unto the ages of ages. Amen. May you all be blessed by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace and may our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. Amen.